The argument we're basically making in the book is to say that both the provision of religious services and non-religious services may be related closely to changes in income inequality that has come about with economic growth in India. Welcome to Ideas of India, a podcast where we examine academic ideas that can propel India forward. My name is Shruti Rajagopalan, and today my guest is Shriya Ayer, a Bibli Fellow and College Lecturer at St. Catherine's College and Affiliated Lecturer and Janeway Fellow at the Faculty of Economics at the University of Cambridge. Her recent book, The Economics of Religion in India, is an excellent survey of her work on religion in India from the economic point of view, studied using the tools of economics. In this book, Shriya analyzes provisioning of religious and non-religious services by different religious organizations in India. She looks at ethnic conflicts, riots, competition between religious organizations and the role of religious education. This work is extremely insightful and sheds light to understand more recent trends of nationalism in India. I had a chance to speak with Shriya about her work on the economics of religion, caste, riots, the rise of the BJP, Hindu nationalism, her intellectual influences, and much more. Both Shriya and I are trained in the field of economics, and our discussion is from a positive and not normative perspective. Our attempt in this conversation, much like Shriya's work, is to analyze trends in religion, conflict, nationalism, and caste. It is neither to condemn nor to condone these trends merely describe and explain. Shriya, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the show. Normally, we jump straight to the book. But in your case, uh, your field or, you know, the economic way of thinking about religion, it is so specialized and so niche that even a lot of economists don't know what it is. So can you start us off by explaining what is the economics of religion, you know, especially the rational choice perspective on religious choice? Thanks so much, Shruti. I'm delighted to be a part of this. The economics of religion is a new and fascinating area of economics research where economists are applying methods from economic theory as well as statistical tools to evaluate the role of religion in society. So here they're looking at the characteristics of religious communities. They're looking at the way in which religious organizations evolve over time. And the reason we're interested in these behaviors is because we think that economists do have much to contribute to broader debates about religion in society, as well as related issues such as religious conflict. When we're thinking about the economics of religion, uh, we use what is essentially called the rational choice approach. And that means we're thinking of a market for religion, just as you think of other goods and services. So there is a demand for religion that comes on the part of adherence. There's the supply of religion that's being provided for by religious organizations. And you're trying to match the demand with the supply. And this is what creates the market for religions. And this is where we think economists have something to contribute because we're in general, economists do look at the evolution of markets of different kinds. At the same time, another characteristic of religion that economists are particularly interested in is the idea of club goods. Uh, Religion is something that is collective. It's something that is shared. And that means that if it is a club good in that sense, it has various characteristics so that people enjoy religion more if it is also shared by others within their community. So that's the other aspect uh, that economists also look at, the club good characteristics of religion as well as determining a demand and supply of religion on the, at the individual basis. So in general, we think of the economics of religion as applying theories from economics as well as statistical tools to evaluate the role of religion in society in various empirical contexts. That's great. I want to pick up a little bit on the club goods aspect. It's unsurprising to you. I'm a George Mason University, Virginia school trained economist. And this is, of course, Buchanan's famous uh, theory of club goods. But he was talking more about provisioning of goods which have a collective characteristic to it, or rather, you know, what we call public goods or quasi public goods. And now you're talking about religion. So my question is, can you clarify for us exactly what we mean by religious goods and services? I imagine that it is 
is not within the realm of economics to talk about are we going to heaven or hell or you know some kind of transcendence so exactly what is the nature of these religious goods or services that different sects provide in a club like fashion so when we're thinking about religious goods and services part of it stems of course from doctrinal differences from theological beliefs if people believe in a particular religion they are adhering to some of the scriptural norms that are associated with that particular religion so that could be thought of as a, a religious good or service it could also be dealing with notions of reincarnation the afterlife uh, these are all benefits that people might actually feel that they getting from religion so they're getting the benefit of worship uh, in this life they might be getting the benefit of what they perceive is going to be the benefit in the afterlife they may be getting benefits from worship in various ways so that's what we think of in terms of religious goods and services but at the same time there is this public good aspect of this as well that we get more benefit from say learning a language or observing a religion if we also think that there are others who are also sharing in that benefit and a lot of communal aspects of religion such as communal worship going to church every sunday observing religious festivals of various kinds these are also a ways in which we are participating in the religious good or service but it depends not only on our own individual participation but also on the participation of others within our community or indeed more globally and i think that when we're thinking about a religious good or service what we're thinking about is what are the benefits that religion might bring either theologically script truly doctrinally or in terms of this kind of a community aspect of religion in one sense the club goods model describes the hindu religion quite well and i mean that in the sense that you know hinduism is non abrahamic religion many people have described it mostly as a collection of different sects that are actually stitched together by the persistence of the caste system on one hand it's quite clear to see religious competition of different sects competing for you know both uh, congregations as well as donations as well as producing services but on the other hand uh, because of the caste system and exactly how rigid it is in the sense that you're born to a particular caste which is uh, you know nobody's choice and caste in one sense in hinduism persists across uh, different lives even so there is very little mobility once we take the caste system into account so what is a good way to think about hinduism and the marketplace for religion and competition once we account for caste rigidity So Shruti I think you're absolutely right in saying that Hinduism is actually quite different to some of the Abrahamic faiths. I mean Hinduism is often described as magic tempered by metaphysics. And it, it is really very much about as you say as it's evolved over time having these different forms where different kinds of Hinduism have actually over time coexisted quite happily if you're just thinking about the religion itself. Bear in mind of course that this is a religion that officially doesn't really have a clerical community in that sense a scriptural book a hierarchy uh, in terms of the religion but what you do see is both lots of sects and cults and others uh, that have developed within the religion and as you say uh, it has a, a very fairly rigid social structure in terms of the caste system so when we're actually thinking about competition between uh, in, within hinduism so we're not thinking here about competition between protestant denominations in the us what we're thinking here much more is competition between the sects and the cults and the various groups within a much broader hindu tradition and i think partly the polytheistic nature of hinduism allows that notion of competition to be interesting in this context as well and on the one hand i think originally as hinduism was originally conceived it is very much a polytheistic religion without a lot of this very strict structure so what happens really is that over time we actually see hinduism even within india changing the kind of hinduism we have today seems much more monolithic in many cases than polytheistic and of course that's tied up with the development of hindu nationalism but that that's a different story if you're actually thinking about our notions of competition relevant to 
Hinduism as they are to other religions such as Christianity. Yes, I think they are, just because of the polytheistic nature of the religion and the fact that you do see lots of different cults and sects and communities that could well be competing for adherence between each other. I want to pick up on the caste rigidity aspect a little bit more in relation to the competition. So in one sense, Hindu society is highly segregated, right? I mean, in terms of where we live, where one worships, you know, what kind of food one eats, what kinds of restaurants one patronizes and so on and so forth. So I understand when you say that there is competition between sex and polytheism lends itself very well or easily to that. But there's a second aspect of competition, especially in club goods, which is inclusion and exclusion. These sects provide great services, both religious and non-religious, to the congregation. But to avoid the free rider problem, they need to have certain practices by which they include people or members within the group and they exclude some people from the group. And, you know, in a lot of sex and cults, this comes in the form of sacrifice or stigma. Sometimes it's in the form of clothing, so on and so forth. In a society where you already have segregation and there is already a different kind of social way of who is included and who is excluded, what does that mean for competition? Is it actually easy to compete or is most of it assigned by birth and within each caste you see a little bit of competition? So I think that, you know, those ideas that come from the club goods literature, the sacrifice and the stigmas, of course, this is the work of Larry Anacone and Ellie Berman and others who have written about this in the context of ultra-Orthodox Jews, who've written about it in, you know, a Christian community context. You know, this this is the idea that in some ways what these communities are doing is specifying codes of dress or food patterns and so forth as a way, as you say, of excluding some and including others. But the rationale for actually doing that, as Larry Anacone and Ellie Berman and others have argued, is really to demonstrate the extent of religiosity of the adherent, to show that you are more committed to the club, you then adopt some of these ways. I think that idea is also relevant in the context of some of the Hindu communities that we're talking about here. They are also, in some ways, using that club goods framework, excluding and including people by imposing, for example, dietary restrictions. So you have some Hindu communities and uh, sub-communities that are vegetarian, others that are not. There are restrictions on dress all over India, for example, even within the Hindu community. Dif- you know, women will tie their sari in different ways. Uh, you know, all of this is also illustrative in many ways of belonging to different communities. And here the social state is interacting with the religion, is interacting with the caste and the class and so forth. So, so I think that Club Good's idea of having these visible manifestations of your religious belief is also relevant in, in the Indian uh, context as well. But I, I do agree with you that on top of that, we have the, you know, the segregation that is also engendered by caste, whether that's ghettoization of communities and how they live. Having said that, I think, you know, with education and so forth, a lot of these segregations do break down as well. I think in, in certain urban areas, at certainly communities are a lot more mixed uh, than they would be, for example, in certain rural areas. So, so I think that the club goods concept is relevant to the Hindu context, to the Indian context, but that I do agree with you that, you know, caste might actually impose a further level of, you know, both stigma and sacrifice that that perhaps hasn't really been written about in quite the same way as as it has in the context of ultra-Orthodox Jews or, or Baptists. To continue the conversation, I mean, now I want to bring in Hinduism uh, in competition with some of the other religions. Hinduism, of course, is the, you know, a sort of practiced by the majority of Indians, about 80, 82 uh, percent, which is a very large number. But in India, the numbers are generally so large that even 13 percent Muslims is a very large community and, you know, so on and so forth. So just keeping that in mind, India has, you know, constitutionally, espoused uh, secularism in the sense that, you know, the government must treat all religious uh, faith and practice equally. But it's a little bit asymmetric in terms of how it has been practiced over 70 years of the Indian constitution. And what I mean by this asymmetric secularism is that very early in the Indian Republic, there were huge efforts to modernize the Hindu religion. 
And this is, of course, you know, in the 1950s, the Hindu court bill and making sure that, you know, marriage practices, adoption, inheritance, all these get, you know, become quite uniform. And I think this had a way of also unifying uh, the Hindu community because it was, a, you know, lots of different sects with lots of different practices, whether it's polygamy or including or excluding women and so on and so forth. However, while doing that, the state also in some sense reduced the power of the clergy, the Hindu clergy, uh, within each sect and their ability to sort, right, uh, which is, you know, who to include and uh, who they can exclude from the particular congregation. Now, at the same time, the Indian Republic didn't quite do that for Muslims, the Muslim communities were allowed to have their own religious practices, their customary practices when it came to marriage and adoption and inheritance. There was no uniform civil code, as we call it in India. Now, what does that do in terms of religious competition? So if one were to impose a uniform civil code, how does that change the sort of competition not just between sects of Hinduism, but also Hinduism with other religions? Does it increase it? Does it decrease it? Does the nature of the religious provisioning change and so on and so forth? So this is a very interesting set of ideas. I think one point to make up front is that unlike other countries, notably the US, this is where I'm thinking of the comparison, conversion is more difficult in the Indian context. So empirically, we don't actually observe huge amounts of conversion across religion from Hinduism to Islam and Christianity. And so I mean, there's some conversion, of course, the movement across religions, religious denominations, which you see in other parts of the world, you don't see it to that same extent in the Indian context. So the competition idea in that sense, I think, again, it becomes more within religion rather than across religion, if we're just thinking about membership of a religious organization. However, if you're thinking more broadly about, you know, how do you reconcile competing communities that are actually living within uh, what is uh, constitutionally, as you very importantly point out, a secular liberal country, the way in which religion was conceived in the 1950s was very much that everyone was allowed to pursue their individual religious beliefs to make community contributions, to develop their religion and so forth. But the state is actually secular and does not have a state, formal state religion. This is actually a very important point, I think, in the Indian context, that the state itself is secular and does not have an official religion, uh, but religious communities of you know, majority or minority or whatever are allowed to practice their religion freely. Now, what that essentially creates is a situation where you then have to deal with issues such as personal law, inheritance, and so forth for the different communities that have actually both developed in different ways and been treated in different ways by the state. So I, I think I think that's something that's important in the Indian context. You know, we, we talk about as you were saying, minorities in the Indian context. But, you know, uh, it's 150 million Muslims. Uh, it's, it's a huge number of people that we are talking about. And so I think the way, you know, different laws with respect to some of these personal issues have developed over time, some of it is driven by the fact that many of the issues are state issues. Some is driven by the fact that religion and uh, religious law influences some of these issues. And some is driven by the fact that I don't actually think there's competition across the religions on those personal issues. I, and I think it's difficult for the state in a country which is supposedly secular to have to legislate on all of these things across different religions. It was not perceived as, as the function of the state, at least originally in 1950, when uh, the Indian constitution was, was put together. The way I have seen some of this competition sort of play out, and I just want to get a sense of how you you would think about it. You're absolutely right in that other than the Dalit community, which we will talk about in a moment, we don't see large scale conversions in terms of between religions. And this is also because Hinduism being the dominant a religious practice does not have conversion or, you know, a set of practices that allow you to convert in and out of the religion. It's a sign that at birth. But what we have seen over the years is, for instance, something like the Shah Bano case, right, where 
the courts try and modernize a particular kind of practice. And this has to do with, you know, the amount of alimony that a Muslim woman would receive in the event of a divorce. And the moment the court tried to modernize the practice a little bit, you know, immediately there was a lot of rent seeking one could say, by the Muslim clergy to ensure that that doesn't happen. And this was a huge political moment in India. And now I want to sort of fast forward two, three decades uh, to the triple talaq, where once again, from the other side, which is the dominant Hindu nationalist groups, there is a lot of rent seeking to ensure that triple talaq, which is a way of, you know, Muslim men divorcing Muslim women within certain sex by just saying talaq three times. And it's as easy as that. And this was considered a very regressive practice. But surprisingly, the demand for it did not come from Muslim women or, you know, a lot of Muslim feminist groups. The demand for it came from the Hindu nationalists who felt that this was a concession that, you know, the Muslim groups received. So in a sense, what I have seen play out in terms of religious competition is it's more at the political rent-seeking level than it is the way, you know, for instance, uh, in Yanakoni's work or something like that, where you where you talk about different sects actually competing for donations and members of the congregation. Do you get the same sense or do you think these are completely different things? They're different kinds of competition. My sense is there are two different issues. One is the Yanakone competing for adherence at the individual level. But I think the other issue that you're raising, which I do think is very important, is the interaction between the state and religion. This is something, of course, that your colleagues at George Mason, Mark Koyama and Noel Johnson have written yes. about very extensively in the context of medieval Europe. And it is something that is relevant to the economics of religion literature, I think, in the Indian context as well. When the state intervenes in issues that are considered within the purview of religion, religious beliefs, religious practice, then it is difficult territory. Because what happens is you get this interaction between the state and religion. Partly it could, in this case of the two issues that you mentioned, whether it was Shabanu or the the triple talaq, it's it's an issue that concerns uh, women's autonomy and women's rights and, and, and their welfare. On the other hand, when the state intervenes in those kinds of decisions, it has to be sensitive to the needs of the issue. But in some cases, as you pointed out, it's it's also a political statement that the state is engaging in by engaging with that kind of issue. And it may be also related, as Johnson and Koyama and others point out in other contexts, to broader issues about toleration of religious minorities, persecution of religious minorities, religious freedoms, and those kinds of ideas as well. So as I see it, the Yanakone literature and the state and religion literature are both relevant to the economics of religion. It's just one is looking more at the politics of religion and the other is focused much more on in a membership of religious organizations and how an individual may choose uh, which religious organization to adhere to. Of course, the two might also intersect at some point if the, the organization that you choose to be a member of is also engaging in political activities. And then, of course, all of these things are going to be inextricably linked. What is a good way to think about Ambedkarite Buddhists? And I just want to give a little bit of context here. So this is, you know, B.R. Ambedkar at the birth of the Republic. Again, he was a champion for, you know, equal protection under the law for everyone. And he's, he's sort of the reason we have that guaranteed in the Indian constitution. India is divided both along lines of caste and along lines of religion. And castes that were historically discriminated against don't have minority protection in India, though they have other kinds of protection, which is through affirmative action and reservation and so on and so forth. And one, I would say, innovation, if I can use that word in the economic sense, that Ambedkar brought about within the depressed castes or the Dalits was to convert out of Hinduism, which had historically oppressed Dalits. What is a way to think about this mass conversion into Buddhism. So in one sense, if I just thought about it as an economist, I would have thought, oh, this is so great. There's going to be this mass conversion. And then Hinduism would have tried to keep, you know, all this large group of people. And I mean, we're not, once again, we're not talking about a small number of people. We're talking about present day Dalits are about 
you know, 270 million strong, right? It's a very, very large community. So, you know, Hinduism would automatically reform or at least large number of, you know, Hindu congregations would reform. And that's how the competition would play out. But what has actually happened is that caste has persisted more than religion. So now we have Buddhist Dalits, we have Christian Dalits, we have Sikh Dalits, we have Muslim Dalits. So in a sense, it's actually flipped on its head. It's not the kind of good competition and, you know, the good results we expect in the marketplace. And we had to almost uh, rethink the idea of, you know, backward classes and depressed classes in India in the 90s because they realized that even converting to Buddhism or Christianity did not eliminate the Dalit disadvantage or, you know, the oppression. So what is a good way to think about, you know, Ambedkarite Buddhists or Christians and, you know, competition in the religious space? So I think that when you're thinking first about conversions in this kind of context, you can't separate it from uh, the economic characteristics. So I did some work with Vani Barua and others some years ago where we were actually looking at scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, uh, how much um, you know they, they, these communities actually benefited from affirmative action policies in the post-independence period and so forth. And I think that a lot of the issues with religion are also very closely tied to the educational employment opportunities, uh, land ownership, credit opportunities of minority communities in general. So, so I think that uh, you know, the way to actually think about this at one level, the problem we really should be addressing is the economic deprivation. Because sometimes people use conversion as a way of getting out of economic deprivation if they feel that they can get more advantage from being in another religion or community and so forth. This may be in addition to their faith faith and their theological beliefs and doctrinal you know, issues and so forth. But the other thing I think which is important in the Indian context specifically is people don't just have one identity. Many economists like Amartya Sen and others have written extensively about the idea of the Indian having multiple identities, which they identify with. And I think at different points, the religious identity has been important. The caste identity has been important. Now the national identity, I think, is also very important. And very often, regional, national, caste, and religious identities are interacting with each other. So uh, my sense is that in some ways, if we're looking at competition across religious groups in India, we're actually looking at a subcategory of that. We're really looking at competition across religious, caste, economic groups, and looking at the economic deprivation as a way of solving some of the religious issues. And that's really where some of my work, for example, has really been focused yeah. on, uh, looking at differences between communities, inequality between communities, educational differences, employment differences, demographic differences. That's really where I think you know we should be putting our energies into. And that might be one way of then de dealing with the competition issue. I don't think you'll ever be able to get rid of competition between groups. But I think the issue more is looking at economic deprivation among certain groups and uh, thinking about how you can ensure at least some kind of equality in opportunity, even if you, we're yeah. not ever going to be in a situation where we have the equality of outcomes. I agree with you here in the sense that the competition between religions and conversion did not lead to the typical good market outcome because there are these structural barriers which didn't disappear simply because of conversion to another religion. So I want to switch gears a little bit and move towards the other big theme in your book, which is this two-way relationship between uh, religion and the economy, or rather economic growth. There are some broad trends globally, and they don't exactly apply one-on-one -on -one to India. So I'll just kick us off on a few of those themes. So globally, it seems like as nations become richer, they are also more secular. Right. One sees this trend uh, playing out empirically when we do cross country comparisons in India. It has been a slightly different relationship. So post liberalization, India has gotten richer and in absolute levels, poverty has decreased and in absolute terms, you know, incomes have increased. But at the same time, Indians have become more religious that bears out in sort of the survey data that you have collected and 
Second, India has also become less secular, right? In the sense that there is more of a sort of a loudness in the religious identity. As you said, we all have multiple identities, but the religious identity has become a little bit amplified in the last two or three decades post-liberalization. And the last consequence of how all of this might be tied to the fact of liberalization and economic growth and, you know, the inequality that bore out of it. So what does some of the empirical research on India tell us about the link between economic growth and religiosity? If you're looking overall at the world as a whole, as you say, the world is, uh, the richer countries have become more secular, but the world as a whole actually has become more religious. And some of the work by Norris and Inglehart and others uh, does, does actually substantiate that. So, uh, and of course, there are some countries like the United States, which are both the richest country in the world, as well as the most religious country in the world. You know, what we're seeing in India in some ways with economic growth, religion becoming more prominent is actually not something that I found very surprising. I think that what we are seeing, though, in the relationship between religion and economic growth is that religion is becoming more important. I think it's also really some of the work that I've been doing in my book, for example, has also been showing how conflict has been related to economic growth as well. So but we, while we've had a lot of economic growth, we've had increases in the incidence of religious conflict, but the intensity of the conflict has actually gone down. So I think that's been a positive benefit of the economic growth. But at the same time, I mean, I don't see religion, the influence of religion actually diminishing in India anytime soon. This broader secularization thesis, which was prominent in some writings about the economics of religion in the 60s and the 70s and so forth, we are seeing, and at, at the moment, for example, 80% of the world does declare a religious affiliation. There are 16% who also say that even if they don't declare an affiliation, they may have some kind of spiritual belief. So, so at the same time, you know, you need to be thinking about how the nature of religion might actually be changing uh, over time. In the specific case of India, I think that, you know, we are going to have increased economic growth. This is going to come with increasing inequality, as our standard macroeconomics tells us. But at the same time, we're not going to see a diminution in any way of the influence of uh, religion. And I think that is partly linked to the way in which religion is also tied up with the role of the state, with politics and with other areas, which are not necessarily economics, and the way in which Hinduism itself has developed over the last 50, 60 years or so, where I think now in the country, it is very closely aligned with the nature of the state as well, which is something we, you know, we talked about the constitution. It's probably something we didn't think about in 1950, but which we, which we are seeing definitely in 2020. So I want to ask you a whole bunch of questions about the rise of Hindu nationalism and the BJP, etc. So I, I'm going to get to that in a minute. But before that, I want to talk a little bit more about the you know, increase in inequality post-liberalization. So while poverty levels have gone down, there is no question that, you know, inequality has increased in India. And uh, one part of it is income or wealth inequality. But there are other margins on which there is inequality, for instance, access to public goods you know, access to education, access to health services, you know, in the case of women, access to the labor market. So there are certain margins on which, you know, sometimes the inequality decreases and sometimes it increases. Now, specifically about, you know, different kinds of religions in India, how do you think of religiosity interacting with inequality on two specific margins? One is the provisioning of religious services. And this is, you know, typically the service, spiritual services, congregations, you know, funerals, weddings, uh, baptisms, things like that. And second, the provision of non-religious services, which is education, you know, health, uh, some on-the-job training, uh, sometimes, you know, these cow lending programs and things like that. So this is really what my, my book is about, uh, the economics of religion in India. So the argument we're basically making in the book is to say that both the provision of religious services and non-religious services may be related closely to changes in income inequality that has come about with economic growth in India. So there's two channels through which I think this might be important. 
The first is one of the arguments I'm, I am making is that over time, you might have actually seen religious organizations, some positioning themselves as uh, more liberal, others positioning themselves as less so, and that uh, by moving to the extremes in this way, this is a way in which organizations are dealing with the increase in income inequality and the fact that very often these organizations are substituting for the lack of state provision in basic services such as education, health, and so forth. So one of the theses that we examined in the book, and which I'm also doing in some related papers with some co-authors here, is, uh, is really looking at whether religious organizations are more likely to differentiate themselves in response to a competition on non-religious service provision. And with the increase in inequality, does that non-religious service provision then increase? So what I would argue is that one of the reasons why we've seen religion being so resilient and so much more visible post-1991 is, is really because it is responding to changes in inequality and competition between groups, which has become much more visible, but also responding to the fact that the Indian population now is extremely aspirational. People want good health, good education, jobs, uh, and, and, and the rest of it. And so sometimes if the state is either not providing a service adequately or not providing enough of the service, then other entities, religious or otherwise, might actually step in to provide those services. What I'm arguing in my book, and this is what we document from our surveys, is really that religious organizations are providing many more services in this post-1991 period in response to that increase in inequality and in response to the demand for some of these services. So I think both religious services and non religious services would definitely be influenced by inequality through this channel. One thing I found very interesting in your research is that even though the sort of demand side of things comes because of inequality, aspiration, you know, weak public goods provisioning by the government and so on and so forth, the supply side is motivated by good old school marketplace competition, right? But the survey data bears out so clearly that these religious organizations know exactly what's happening in their neighborhood or their district. They know what services are not being provided by the state and by other organizations. And even though they're a little bit reluctant to say that they are competing with other religious organizations, it seems, you know, a little bit not cool to say that they're actually competing with other organizations because they, they seem to be trying to both fill the gaps as well as make sure that, you know, their congregation, nobody goes to sleep, uh, you know, on an empty stomach or no child is turned away if they need, uh, you know, footwear or clothing or food or education and so on and so forth. So what what did you find when you were doing some of this research? I think this was actually something that I was surprised by uh, when 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 we first started doing the surveys because as you say these organizations essentially are spiritual organizations faith based organizations that is their main you know motive operation but what we found when we were doing the surveys is that they are both very aware of the services that they are providing, but also very aware of the services that the religious competitors are providing, even if they don't think of them as religious competitors in, in that sense. This was something that was very striking, the in-depth level of knowledge that both people have about their local communities and about other religious entities in the local community that are also providing these services. I mean, like all economists, I think a little competition here is a good thing uh, because it's ensuring that the customer Customers in this case are actually getting, you know, some education provision, healthcare, if they are, are providing some of these services in areas where those that service provision is weakly provided by the state, then some education is better than no education at all. I, I think is, that's the way I look at this issue. But I think what it also does reveal is the extent of community involvement in wanting to, um, you know, develop some of these areas. People are very keen to send their children to school, to get the best health care, to have good jobs. And they're, you know, willing to accept it from different entities, including the religious organizations. Of course, this brings up a much wider policy issue, which is if you've then got all of these entities providing their 
various kinds of education and healthcare and, and credit access and so forth. You need to think about bigger issues of, of regulation or monitoring and what exactly are the services that are being provided and how. But what is very striking is the knowledge of the services, certainly in the competition. And this is something we specifically introduced into the survey to try and understand how much each organization knew about other organizations within the same religion, as well as other organizations not in the same religion. In both cases, there is extensive knowledge on the ground of what those activities entail. Um, So I think that in the end will be uh, good for the customer. One other thing that was very striking to me from this particular aspect of your survey on on competing, especially in providing non-religious services and, you know, closing the gap of public goods and quasi-public goods was what we think of when we think of canonical models in uh, the economics of religion. The question is always about inclusion and exclusion. They are two sides to the same coin, right? So a lot of religious practices and congregations have rules to ensure that there isn't a free rider problem, you know, that people don't just come and eat your food or, you know, free ride on educational services without partaking in the spiritual aspect or without giving back to the community. What I found very interesting about these services that you talked about is that they are more inclusive than not. Because they are catering largely to the poor. So in a sense, you know, the industrial organizations, so to say, of these religious organizations, there's a split. So there are members of the congregation who are well off and there the different organizations are competing for donations and things like that. But when it comes to service delivery, the customer is not the same as the member of the congregation who's actually donating the money. It is a completely different group of people, usually very poor. And it's not that they want to avoid the free rider problem. They want more people to come and join in the partaking of those services without paying for them. And I found this genuinely surprising. What do you think is going on here? So what we're really arguing here is that the religious organizations have sensed the demand and are providing the services. However, services are costly to provide. And so what we're arguing is that they may differentiate themselves on the religious spectrum in order to minimize the cost of provide the competition and the cost of providing services on the non-religious spectrum. And that's the way in which they're able to attract uh, adherence. So, so I think that that's why there are two sides to really looking at this, that yes, the services are very inclusive. Most of religious organizations, the services they're providing are open to members of all religions. It's just that in certain cases, some religions use the services more than others. But this is an important issue issue that um, in many cases, the services are primarily used by the poor. And because they are used by the poor and the religious organizations are competing for more adherence amongst that group, they are then also seeking to minimize the cost of providing those services and thereby also, um, in that sense, differentiating the religious proposition. So this is really what we're we're arguing, that the religious proposition and the non-religious services might actually be linked because of poverty and inequality in a way that we might not have thought of before and that that might be the real reason why religion persists even though you have increased economic growth in uh, in in India today, um, in some ways, you know, uh, uh, writing the book really makes a case for better secular provision by the state. Uh, Because, of course, if you look at the history of countries like the country that I live in, the UK, when you had the development of the welfare state, you then saw the decline in the influence of religion. So really, the argument I'm making with the book is not just documenting the service provision by the religious organizations, but really making a very strong case that if the welfare services provided by the state were, in fact, to improve, This minimizes the uh, necessity for any other entity to have to substitute in and, and, and provide that. But until then, you're going to see many entities, including the religious organizations, providing a lot of these non-religious services, but it comes at a cost. 
Absolutely. So I want to talk about the cost a little bit and I want to zero in on one particular kind of good that's being provided, which is education, right? There's a lot of controversy, not just in India, but across the world on religious versus secular education. It is possible for religious organizations to provide a secular education. So there are a lot of religious schools which are substituting, in a sense, for the state, right? And they are not providing the same skills and the same education that one would see in a secular school. But the other side of the argument is it's better than nothing, right? They're providing some basic literacy and some basic mathematics and so on. In India, of course, the the schools that are demonized are the madrasas, which are the schools run by the Islamic clergy. And, you know, I mean, in the United States, it would be Catholic schools who, because the secular education teaches evolution or, you know, some other fault line. So, How does one think about this? Because the empirical research suggests that religious education can be a complement to secular education. There's no problem with religious education by itself. In fact, you know, uh, learning religious texts, repeating them, reciting them actually improves literacy levels. It helps build human capital and, you know, so on and so forth. In India, in particular, a lot of the religious education is imparted in the vernacular uh, or the regional language, which is also spoken at home. So, you know, the parents and the community can actually contribute to the education of the student. But They say that the cost is it comes with regressive ideas, you know, segregation between men and women. And of course, the worst case scenario is, you know, the the whole uh, is there Islamic fundamentalism being taught at madrasas and so on and so forth, which is a, naturally a minority of the religious schools. So how does one think about this problem, you know, as of religious education, whether it's a complement or a substitute and what are the consequences when it's a complement or a substitute? to secular education? So I think this is a very important issue to consider, Shruti. If we look at other populations, so if you look at historical Jewish populations, for example, there's work by Carmel Chiswick and others that showed that uh, there was this complementarity between religious education and secular education that was good for that community. That argument, I think, still holds even in the Indian context as well, that there is a complementarity between religious education and secular education. However, I think one of the issues in the Indian context is that this is perhaps an issue that could have been sorted out way back in the 1950s when India adopted, I mean, you mentioned the issue of language, India adopted the the three language formula and the third language was decided that it was going to be Sanskrit and not Urdu. I think had it been Urdu and not Sanskrit at that time, uh, we might not be seeing so many of the issues that you're uh, alluding to now, 70 years Uh, later. I think the issue is that for, I think this came out in some of our surveys as well, that for some of the minority religions, and this is true not just of India, but in other cases as well, as you were mentioning Catholic schools and so forth, parents might feel the need for their children to have a religious education in addition to the secular education. The question is, where do you then provide it? Do you provide it as part of the secular schooling structure, or as is what is happening now, uh, you have the religious schools that are providing the religious education as a complement to the secular education. So in Kerala, for example, it's a, there are very good examples of uh, students who attend maktabs and then go to other schools as well. So they get the religious education and the secular education. There are examples from other parts of the world too. So I think the issue that really needs to be thought about in a lot more depth is how do you provide the religious education? Is it good in inculcating values? But most importantly, I think in the current Indian situation, the religious education system has been very good in inculcating the knowledge of Urdu, which has been important. So for both language as well as for values that comes through the religious education system, that's going to be helpful. And that's true whether of the Muslim religion or the Hindu religion or other religions. The wider question, though, is that if a student is only attending a religious school, uh, and we have data that shows about 5% of the school-going population in India now attends a madrasa, for example, um, what are the employment characteristics of the graduates of these schools? Are they then qualified to be able to compete in the open labor market, which is ideal? 
what you would want. People from any schooling system should be able to compete in the open labor market. One of the arguments I'm making in my book, for example, is that introducing subjects like mathematics, science, English, computers is going to be very important in increasing the employability of graduates from religious schools of of all religions. And I think that that is really where we should be looking at when we're thinking about the debates about religious education, how it fits with secular education. We have a secular schooling system. We've got a widely developing religious uh, schooling system. And it's a question of how to actually reconcile the two in a harmonious way that ensures shows that if parents want their children to have a religious education, they have it. But at the same time, if they want their child to have a secular education as well, they have the opportunities for both. One thing to mention, and I think this is particularly true in the Indian context, is that, again, if you look at the economic composition of of students who actually use the religious schools only, they tend to be from a poorer socioeconomic background than, uh, than others. And that's, again, a very important factor because I do feel, as I said earlier, that a lot of the issues with religion in India are actually economic issues and issues surrounding economic deprivation and unequal access to opportunity that really need to be fixed. And of course, it's a long process to do that. But I think that's how we should see the religious schooling versus secular schooling issue, not as religious schooling versus secular schooling, but actually as complements, religious schooling and and secular schooling actually working together to fulfill the needs of the population as parents might uh, want them. Yeah, because when we see them acting as compliments, say, in the Jewish community, we're really talking about a group which has some of the highest human capital and income levels in the world, right? And when we're talking about madrasas, it's not an apples to apples comparison because we're talking about some of the poorest people in the world, especially in South Asia, who don't necessarily have access directly to any other kind of, you know, normal government school, either because their area doesn't have a good school yet, or their family has not been able to give them the tools to understand the curriculum that's going on at the school and, you know, so on and so forth. And I agree with you that I think the madrasa issue is an important one. You know, in some recent research by Asher, Novosad and Rafkin, they find that upward mobility, intergenerational mobility, has fallen substantially amongst Muslims in the last 20 years, you know, in the post-liberalization world, in a way that it hasn't even with scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, because they have the reservation and affirmative action program, which has helped lift, you know, intergenerational mobility. I want to switch to, you know, a different aspect. This is a little less in the book, but it's there in a lot of your other research. And this is about the rise of Hindu nationalism. Uh, I mean, you've written a great piece, which is, I, is it out yet? The one on uh, Johnson and Koyama's uh, book on persecution and toleration. They are my colleagues at the Mercator Center and they write about what factors ensured that it was in the interest of policymakers to move towards greater religious freedom because we know that there is a really tight link between religious freedom and the rise of liberalism. And what we're seeing in India right now is sort of the opposite uh, of, you know, the rise of religious liberalism, we're seeing this kind of monolithic, you know, rise of Indian nationalism. So I have a few questions, you know, on this overall theme of the rise of nationalism. So my first question, and this has less to do with economics and more to do with sort of theology, my understanding based on my own upbringing and also reading, you know, the little I know about Hinduism, is that Hinduism was always a religion based on conduct, and not one necessarily anchored around belief, right? In fact, I've been told by my very devout grandfather that even my atheism or, you know, nir ishvarvad, as we would call it, is, is part of Hinduism, right? It's, it's, it's assimilated within Hindu philosophy. But this has completely changed now, right? I mean, now it has become a matter of faith, not just conduct. And a second change has been that Hinduism has started getting some major focal points like Abrahamic religions. And in India, most recently, that is the issue of the Ram Mandir, right? Just last month, we saw the Prime Minister of India being a very important participant in what was basically a religious ceremony aired for the entire country to see, which was setting the foundation stone for the new Ram Mandir 
at the old contested site between uh, you know the Ram Mandir and the Babri Masjid in Ayodhya. So what has happened to Hinduism in your opinion? Why did it go from you know conduct to belief and why has the belief become the Ram Mandir? This is a difficult question. I think uh, in my perspective we've seen a change in the nature of Hinduism that is linked very closely to the development of Hindu nationalism. So we were talking earlier about how if you're thinking about Hinduism in the abstract as a religion, it is in its Vedic form, it was very much about polytheistic gods and you know no one scriptural book and so forth and no hierarchical clergy, mandatory religious attendance like, like some other religions. But over time, I think in the last, you know, 73 years, uh, what we have seen is the rise of a, a different kind of Hinduism. And it is one that I think is based very much on visible representations of the religion. And uh, so the structure actually looks far more monotheistic than polytheistic to me. It's also a structure, I think, that is based on very visible representations of the religion. So temple building, ratyatras, you know, things that we've seen over the last 73 years or so have now become very important facets of the religion. And this, I think, is partly also aided by wider developments in technology, uh, which has made religion much more accessible to people, whether it's, you know, through the radio or the television or social media or other kinds of uh, ways of bringing people together. So, in, and, and I also think that competition has had something to do with this as well. The way in which uh, Hinduism has changed over the years is also in response to what has been happening with secular nationalism, you know, the developments in the Indian National Congress, uh, developments of British colonialism. There's all of these other fa factors that also have affected the rise of Hindu nationalism, which many political scientists in India have written quite extensively uh, about. So I think the nature of Hinduism as we see it today is quite different. Um, and it's related really really to the change in India's politics as well as its economics in that sense. And what we have now is, I think, an example actually of the Johnson and Koyama conditional toleration model, where you've got, uh, you know, the, the connection between the majority Hindu religion and the state with conditional toleration for the religious minorities. Yeah, and I'm actually arguing in the paper that you mentioned, which is just written, it's coming out in the JEL, is actually arguing that this Johnson Koyama model is actually quite relevant to the Indian context as well. And I I think that's really what's happened. The development of Hindu nationalism has really made the relationship between state and religion much closer in practice, even if not in, in theory. India is, of course, still constitutionally secular and liberal and so forth. But uh, I think the visible representation of religion and the way in which it is interacting with the state now is very different to the situation in, in 1950. I want to talk about this, you know, the interaction between politics and religion by segueing into a different paper of yours, which I found fascinating for multiple reasons. This is your work on religious riots and their impact on vote share for the BJP, which is the Bharatiya Janata Party, and also the party of, you know, the Modi-led government. Your research, of course, is about state-level elections. It's not talking about national elections. I mean, I, I'm going to give the story away. You find that... If there is a riot in the year before the year of the election at the state level, then you see an increase in the vote share of the BJP. There are two things I find fascinating about the paper. One is, of course, your instrumental variable, which is incredibly unique. And I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about that. But the other is what this means for Indian politics and, you know, the BJP's vote share and also their, you know, persistence sort of uh, in national governance uh, long term in India going into the future. So can you tell us a little bit about this paper and also, you know, what, what it means in a normative sense for policy outcomes in the future? Thanks, Shruti. So, so this is work with Anand Srivastava, I should say, who is uh, based at the Azim Premji University in uh, India. We published this paper in the Journal of Development Economics a few years ago. And what we're really arguing here is that, yes, a riot can affect 
the vote share of the BJP. I think we predict that it would increase the vote share by 5 to 7%. And in some ways, all that we were doing in that paper is to quantify an argument that many journalists and others had been making for a long time in uh, you know, the Indian popular press, that you might find that there are situations where you have riots that then affect the vote share. We're just providing the bare bones of the quantitative evidence that that was indeed the case. And we're putting a number on that by saying that in this particular sample that we were looking at in these state elections, it was five to seven percent. The broader issue that that raises, I think, is really thinking about, you know, whether there is any motive there to instigate a riot in order to influence the vote share. Now, we don't say anything about that uh, in our paper because our job was just to document the statistical evidence. But, you know, others have written about those kinds of issues. And it does raise the question about, you know, when, when you observe certain election outcomes that occur, You hope very much that, uh, you know, a riot was not instigated in order to ensure the requisite, uh, requisite outcome. So that's the broader policy issue. In terms of the instrument that you were interested in, um, you know, for, for, for economists out there who are interested in issues of causality and identification of these causal effects, of course, what we're using is festivals. And again, this is an idea that is not, is not new. It's actually come from uh, others who have argued that something very obvious at festival time, people congregate. What we argued, though, was to say that if a Hindu festival fell on a Friday, which we know is a holy day for the Muslim community, then that was going to predict whether a riot uh, occurs uh, or or not. And what our data is simply showing is that it it does. So we essentially use what we call the festival instrument. as, uh, And because in Hinduism, the dates of the festival are determined by the uh, lunar calendar. Lunar calendar. Uh, lunar calendar. Essentially, what happens is the date of the festival then moves around uh, for different years, which then means that we can use that to identify the effect, which is what we do in that uh, in that work. But I think the broader question that we were really interested in is whether there was any kind of quantitative link that one could establish between uh, the occurrence of a religious riot and the outcome in an election. No, I was just very charmed by that instrumental variable because when one reads papers on religious conflict, almost always it is a weather-related instrument and that can get quite repetitive and tiresome. So it was quite interesting when I found a completely different instrumental variable. But that aside, I appreciate your point of it being a larger issue and I want to touch upon two things related to riots, both of which you allude to in your book and in your broader research. This is, you know, there is some, of course, good research even outside of India that riots are not just caused by, you know, some kind of religious hate or friction, but it's also a question of state capacity, right? And this has been written about by, you know, multiple people. I think Ed Glazer and DePascal have uh, their paper, which talks about, you know, two aspects to riots. One of which is the opportunity cost of time, which is, you know, of course, uh, of the individuals participating in the riot. But the other part of it is also, you know, the potential of punishment. And if there's weak state capacity and very low probability of punishment, then you would you know, likely see greater participation in riots. There's another paper by one of my colleagues at uh, GMU and the Mercatus Center, Alex Tabarok, who talks about, you know, something very similar. This is a simple model of crime waves and riots and revolutions. Again, the argument's very simple that if there is less likelihood of being caught because a lot of people are partaking in the crime simultaneously, which reduces the chances of being caught, you know, then more people are likely to join the group which is engaging in the criminal activity. So there seems to be a pretty tight link between state capacity and the incidence of riots. So I want to talk about two things here. One is, is it just a coincidence that as India's state capacity, especially in the weaker, in the criminal justice system, becomes weaker, we have also seen the rise of the BJP and Hindu nationalism? Do you think those two things are just coincidental? Or do you think there's something else going on, you know, in the underlying political economy? So I haven't done research on this specific area 
But, I, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if state capacity was linked to a religious conflict. I think that if there are uh, interested graduate students out there, I think this would be a very interesting topic in the context of India to, to look more closely at. I, I think that, you know, many of these other papers have shown this link has been very strong in other contexts. So I'm, it would be interesting to see whether it's also important in the Indian context uh, as well. You know, one of the things you also need, would need to bear in mind when thinking about riots. So in some of the work uh, which Anand Srivastava and I did, for example, the data set on, uh, on which we calculated these riots was actually an event study and uh, which also had information on the causes of riots. And what is interesting there is how many non-religious causes uh, are, yes. are usually attributed to riots. Uh, you know, one of, you know, we talk uh, now about the Babri Masjid uh, Ram Temple dispute and so forth. Uh, it is a prime piece of urban property. Uh, is something that's that's frequently overlooked. And many many examples of riots that you do see all over India sometimes have political, economic, property, other kinds of disputes that are associated with it. Especially urban congestion, right? Urban congestion seems to be a big theme in these kinds of riots because it places people in a very tight spot, quite literally, you know, at the same time. And and triggers can cause things to go out of control much more frequently and much more easily than you would expect somewhere else. So in, if you look at the data from 1950 onwards in terms of riots, most of the riots are urban riots. It doesn't mean that there have been very severe rural riots as well. Yeah. Um, but, but uh, you know, uh, many of them are in urban congested centers. So, so I think we really do need a lot more research on some of these interactions, the causes, underlying causes of riots, how it interacts with perhaps local state capacity, police presence, the ability of, of government officials, uh, civil servants and others to to navigate these riots when they occur. You know, there's a lot of a lot more research I think that that uh, can be done in these contexts. I think many people have written about them already, but I think uh, having some quantitative evidence on linking all yeah. of these things together would be extremely useful. And this is, yeah. I think, an important area of future research, which would tie in with a lot of the work on medieval Europe, uh, which yeah. uh, many of our colleagues. Uh, other economist colleagues, economic historian colleagues have been writing about uh, for the last several. In one sense, one theme that kept emerging from your book for me was how much of both the religious conflict and the competition and cooperation has to do with state provisioning of public goods. You know, if only the state did its job when it came to providing secular education, then you wouldn't see a lot of the things that one sees in religious competition. If only the state provided, you know, sensible urban regulation so that there could be a quick increase in supply of housing and you don't see, you know, building up of slums or very high degree of urban congestion, then you wouldn't get the kinds of, you know, uh, street riots, even small incidents that that one gets. The reason I was linking so directly to state capacity, I think the last riot I read about in detail was the one that happened in Delhi just before the COVID pandemic. And uh, one of the reasons that many journalists wrote about anecdotally was Donald Trump was visiting India and, you know, New Delhi at the time, and a lot of the police force had been directed towards VIP security and and things like that. And of course, you know, the neighborhood in which the riot took place was much poorer than, you know, where the VIP and the police bandobast is happening and so on and so forth. I want to move from riots to something that is related, but I still want to think about it a little bit differently. And this is the political economy of hatred. Once again, I'm, I'm referencing sort of, you know, Ed Glazer's canonical paper on this, where he says that, you know, hatred as we normally perceive is not irrational. You know, there is a demand for hatred, which is the you know, sort of consumers or, you know, participants willingness to hear hateful stories about uh, the other group, whatever that other group might be. It could be another sports team. It could be another religion. It could be another caste, gender, so on and so forth. And the supply is typically, you know, in the case of religion, it is by politicians and the clergy. But, you know, media houses, there's there there are multiple groups that are willing to supply and, you know, facilitate this consumption of hatred. And the level of hatred increases with, 
you know, intergroup economic differences or inequality, but it's also linked to the funds received by right-wing groups. So what I just described is sort of the Cliff Notes version of the Ed Laser paper. I see that playing out almost on a one-on-one basis in India at the moment in the sense that there is a lot of misinformation you know at the beginning of the covid pandemic because there was one super spreader event by an islamic group then you know suddenly it was muslims have brought covid to india sort of narrative there is a lot of both misinformation and hateful information which is out there there's clearly a very large group willing to consume this information and propagate it how much do you think this has to do with the increase in economic inequality and also the differences post liberalization in political funding you know these are sort of the two main reasons many people attribute to the rise of the bjp and i i thought maybe we can link it in some way though at the moment anecdotally to the rise of uh, you know production and consumption of hatred so how would you think about that like if you were to write a paper on this what's a good way to think about this in the indian context so i think the rise in income inequality is definitely a part of of this story i mean there's no doubt with economic growth inequality has risen we've already talked about the fact that populations are aspirational i think the other issue is actually jobs because you know while on the one hand you know we can put a lot of resources into increasing education and getting a lot of people educated uh, men and women and so forth you need to have em- good employment outcomes once you've actually had the increases in education and i think where we might be having where this is linked to the riots and other issues and so forth is that if people feel that they do not have access to good jobs government jobs is important in the indian context and so forth then and that's going to be you know creating the underlying conditions for tensions of various kinds so i think actually you know dealing with issues in the labor market are actually going to be quite important i have a project that i'm working on at the moment with two other co-authors we've just started the project but we're really trying to look at religion and occupational differences and you know because you've seen big changes in education since the 1950s but some you know some groups are in certain occupations compared to others and this kind of issue i think needs to be examined a lot more so i think you know that the political economy of hatred story works if the underlying conditions for it are there in this case i think the you know the labor market conditions in india are probably driving the the you know the, what, what's going on with the riots and the hatred and so forth i think this is also an area where the media need to be you know very responsible in terms of you know putting forward the good stories uh, as well and you know what is most salient in terms of describing the good work as well as the you know the other stuff so 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 my sense is that you know one can tie in the political economy of hatred narrative to what's going on in india at the moment but i think the with with much more focus on the underlying situation in 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 the labor market there of course you know with what's happened with covid in the last few months this has just exacerbated a lot of the a lot of the issues uh, particularly because of the issues with migrant workers and so forth this has really made the whole issue of the labor market in india much more complex it has also made it uh, much more tense uh, in the last uh, few months certainly but longer term i think this is something that needs to be looked at very closely Yeah and I think in addition to the points that you made about the labor market I think there is also inequality in terms of status and of course a lot of that comes with the job but it's also status within the family within the neighborhood and so on I recently read this book by Snigdha Poonam called Dreamers where she's written about gaurakshaks and how they basically you know young men who should be in the job market and should have good jobs because they have received basic education but they don't and one way to raise their status within their community is to become a gaurakshak because that is the entry point to get some respect from your peers and so on and so forth so i i very much agree with you that you know it's not just a question of income inequality i think it's also a question of jobs or uh, status you know relative status of between the genders and so on and so forth. So I want to move on to some other questions and uh, I want to start with your 
intellectual background and influences and, you know, what made you pursue this path and become, you know, an economist who studies religion? I know the little bit that I know about your background. I know that, you know, you come from the family of Dr. Sarvapali Radhakrishnan. You're his great granddaughter. Of course, he's very well known as the first vice president of India and second president of India and so forth. But he was also a great religious philosopher and a religious scholar. Is that family influence? How much did that contribute to your intellectual influences? And, you know, what was your path towards becoming an economist? The family influence was important to the extent that we read the books of, of Radha Krishnan and uh, Sarve Pali Gopal and others, uh, both in history and in the philosophy of religion, this influenced my early uh, interest in, 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 in religion, uh, for sure. In terms of how I got into economics, I, I actually started out um, here doing work on religion and demography. That was really how I first started looking at demographic differences between religious groups in India, in South India in particular, in Karnataka. And then uh, from that interest in religion and demography, uh, I then went into studying, you know, the economics of religion per se. I think like most uh, people who grew up in India, you are acutely aware of income inequality, of poverty, of culture, of these kinds of issues. And, and that prompted me to have some interest in going into the field of development economics as such, and then the economics of religion in uh, particular. But I was greatly aided by uh, mentors and uh, reading the work of many of the people we've spoken about today. That certainly inspired me to work in the economics of religion. What is a good introduction to that field when it comes to, you know, young scholars in India? Aside from you and, you know, some of your co-authors, Anand Srivastav, Rohit Tikku, who are, uh, you know, Latika Chadri, uh, Jared Rubin, and they've done some work. Who, what, what is a good introduction aside from your book for young students who would like to get into the economics of religion? I think if you're a young person and you're excited by uh, wanting to know more about the economics of religion, I, I would actually recommend Larry Yannikone's paper, An Introduction to the Economics of Religion, that was published in the Journal of Economic Literature. My paper on the Journal of Economic Literature, on well, New Economics of Religion, is sort of an update of Larry's original paper. Timur Quran has uh, also published in the same journal on Islam and economic development. I think if one is interested to read more about economic theory of religion, uh, one should look at the work of Jean-Paul Carvalho and Michael McBride. If you're interested in econometric issues of causality and identification and how to resolve these neatly, the work of Dan Hungerman. And of course, uh, people that you've already uh, mentioned, uh, Jared Rubin, Mark Koyama, Noel Johnson. These are all scholars either working in, um, really working in the economic history of religion as well. Oh, um, Sasha Becker, many of whom have, uh, I think, made big contributions to this field and are collectively working as a group in order to promote this field for um, you know, future generations of, of scholars. I think one thing to say about it is, at one level, it is a new field. At another level, it's actually quite an ancient field, because yes. Adam Smith was the one who first wrote about it in the theory of moral sentiments um, and, and uh, so forth. So I think if you, you can read the, the and I, you should read uh, Max Weber, Adam Smith, the early readings on the economics of religion, and then, of course, how more recently, in more recent decades, economists have picked it up. And uh, I'm delighted that now it's such a thriving field. What is your writing process like? One of my colleagues here at St. Catherine's told me once that you should write 250 words a day, whatever it is, whether it's a paper or a book or, or uh, uh, something and a working paper, an article that you should do 250 words a day. So I enjoy writing, certainly. I think, uh, you know, if, if you're a young person starting out and thinking about, uh, you know, how to, to write, I think, you know, the idea is really the most important, right, on something that you're passionate about, that you're interested in. And I think, you know, I, 
I try as far as I can also to read widely outside my discipline as well. I think if you are working in an area like the economics of religion, you obviously read what the economists are writing in the subject, but you should also be aware of what is going on more uh, broadly in other disciplines that are related. As far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, as a busy academic, you're reconciling research and teaching and administration and other things. So when I can get the time to write, I do my 250 words a day. Uh, But um, uh, when I don't, I try to make up for it thereafter. Something that I've also always found very useful is to run some of the ideas that I've had or uh, pieces of writing past, you know, family members, friends, others, you know, if if your mother and father don't think that your research is exciting, it's very difficult to make it exciting to everyone else in the world out there. So so it's also frequently useful, I think, to to run it past your colleagues, run it past your family and friends. Uh, This is something that that, that, that I, I try to do. And then I found that periodically useful and get some great mentors. I think that's also a piece of advice that I would like to give. All of us are influenced by those who've gone before us. Uh, And if you have some great mentors who take an interest in your work, uh, you'll probably find that, you know, their world was full of rejected papers and (laughs) they've had to persevere and persevere and persevere uh, in in order. And and at some point, uh, I think the only thing I will say is that luck really does change at some point. And people <laughs> your work, and uh, you know, life is then not full of rejected papers. Who were some of your mentors? Uh, you know, both in the field that you work in, but also more broadly. You know, whether it's in India from your family, uh, you know, from your years in Delhi University or Cambridge. I think you know, my teachers have always been my mentors, I think throughout, uh, whether in school or at university, um, you know, specifically in the area, you know, people like Larry Anacone, Ellie Berman, uh, Stephen Derloff, uh, you know, have, have been, you know, big influences on, on uh, my writing. Uh, Sheila Ogilvie, who was my PhD supervisor here in Cambridge, who works on medieval Europe, she is a very um, uh, important influence on on my work as well. But I think it's really important, both in your area as well as in terms of how to be as an academic, to have those mentors because uh, that they really uh, share their experiences with you, and that's actually quite useful when uh, you are uh, planning your own career. Uh, I think I, I, I'm very grateful for the department that I'm in. You know, this is uh, Cambridge is a place that has, you know, great economists, but it's also a place where you interact with people across many different disciplines. So uh, I, I was fortunate to be able to talk to many scholars of South Asia who've uh, been in this place as well, who've also been, you know, great supporters and mentors. So I think having a combination of people that you can talk to uh, is, is actually very crucial for, uh, for, for young academics. What are you reading right now? What am I reading right now? I just finished reading Persecution and Toleration. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Uh, This is a wonderful book by Mark Koyama and Noel Johnson. Uh, What are your, you know, immediate projects or, you know, big future projects uh, within the field? So I'm I'm doing three different projects at the moment. So one was this project on religion and labor markets in India with Girish Bahel and Anand uh, Srivastava, which we've just started. Uh, we're also doing work on religion and COVID-19. Uh, so we're looking at the way in which uh, religious networks might have spread uh, COVID and the effects of the suspension of religious services and so forth on and lockdowns in general on mental health. Uh, we're currently doing a survey in the U.S. Uh, we hope to extend it to other countries if possible. I've also got a project which I'm doing with colleagues here in Cambridge on religion and insurance in Brazil, because one of the issues that uh, which came up with the India work certainly was the importance of public service uh, provision. Uh, One of the things that I'm quite interested in is the growth of the Pentecostal movement in Brazil, uh, which has also been very widespread uh, and again has targeted, uh, you know, a a different segment of, of the Brazilian population. We're doing a survey there at the moment. So it's really working on religion and COVID, religion and labor markets in India, religion and insurance in Brazil uh, at the moment. (laughs) I really look forward to reading it. And I can't let you go without asking one last COVID-related question, which is also our most important question. What are you binge watching at the moment? (laughs) 
I was watching a suitable boy, uh, which they just showed us on. Uh, it was a wonderful book when it came out on British television. So I was binge watching Suitable Boy and reruns of it. <laughs> Do you recommend it? Yes, highly. Okay, I have been very nervous about watching the show because I love Vikram Seth and Suitable Boy is one of my favorite books and I love Meera Nair and I and I thought that if it's not as good as I imagine it will be I would just be heartbroken. So I've I've kept away from it so far but I'm glad you recommended it so maybe I'll give it a go. I think you should. It's a wonderful it's it's, a, it's they've done it wonderfully. Okay, I'm so thrilled to hear that. Thank you so much for your time and you know it was just really lovely speaking with you about your research and getting all the insights on India and thank you for doing this. Thank you so much for having me Shruti. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for listening to Ideas of India. If you enjoy this podcast, please help us grow by sharing with like-minded friends. You can connect with me on Twitter at S Rajagopal. And here is a sneak peek of my next conversation with Viral Acharya on his quest for restoring financial stability in India. I'll start with a simple analogy. I sometimes think of the economy as like a car that has to function on four wheels. There's the government, there's the central bank. So I think of them as sort of like the public or the regulatory sides of things. And then there are two other wheels, which is the real economy and the financial sector. For the economy to work well, all of these four wheels need to work in tandem and together. At different points of time in India's history, the government has become too powerful. Now you can just imagine that a car that is trying to power forward just on one wheel, it can't really traverse too much distance. I think we need to understand this, and the crowding out is playing out in all the other three wheels, so to speak.